Shalom Israel, Most High in Christ Bless. It's been a while since I've done something like this, but uh, Lord's will, I'll be able to make some more content soon enough, and I'll get back doing the work uh, as much as I can. Uh, we'll talk more about that at the end of the video, but uh, the Spirit's been weighing on me heavy to uh, talk about abortion, and is it right with God? Is it not right with God? Does he care at all? Uh, we're going to touch on it today, and of course, I'm going to give you thus said the Lord. But I wanted to start with a couple of videos that I've seen that made me uh, think about this topic. Uh, I saw this panel with Samantha B here and this Edomite woman. And you're going to see uh, who she brings in to discuss this topic. I invited a Catholic. A Muslim. And a Jew. To a bar to talk about abortion right so of course <laughs> she brought in three women to discuss this topic uh it's not like they're going to be biased about it at all let's start with a really easy question whose religion is right <laughs> <laughs> i'm just kidding is god opposed to abortion there's no ban on abortion in islam there is no ban on abortion at any point for any reason by any method. All right, okay. I can't really Judaism, attest to Islam. Abortion is permitted, and where the pregnant person's life is at stake, it's required because the health and well being of the pregnant person comes first. And of course, she talks about Judaism as well, and I can't uh, attest to, to Judaism uh, because they follow the Talmud. And like I said, I can't attest to uh, Islam because they follow the Quran. I don't believe in either of those. The Talmud is pretty much just commentary on the scriptures. But uh, according, we'll, we're going to get into like what the uh, Torah says about it and what the Tanakh says about it. Okay. Jamie. A mm -hmm. little more complicated. <laughs> Bad news. Well, let's bear in mind that what I'm about to say is a teaching created by men who are ostensibly celibate, mm -hmm. who have no inroads or connection to the lives of women. Because, and, and of course, she's got to give this whole big preamble because she is about to say something that she doesn't even believe. Why is she here representing this belief whenever she doesn't even believe it? They do not have wives. They do not have daughters. Great start. Yeah. And the Catholic Church teaches that in almost every circumstance, abortion is murder. Is it? And see, she didn't even want to say that, but of course, she knows that uh, she would get a lot of flack from her, her Catholic people if, if she didn't say that, because that's what Catholicism teaches. In the Bible? No. In the Christian scriptures, there is no mention of abortion. I mean, And of course, she's going to sit here and say the Christian scriptures as if, like, the whole Torah and Tanakh and Apocrypha is in Christian scriptures. <laughs> But uh, that's pretty much all I wanted out of this one. Uh, we're about to touch on some things that they said. But, uh, first, I want to get through this other video that I had, and then we'll go straight into the scripture. And you know, on one level, I, I want to say that you should respect people's religious differences on the matter. But fuck that, because when you look into the book that they're actually claiming authority from me, don't even say the shit that they say that it's saying! Seriously, look it up. There's literally no passage in the Bible that says abortions are bad or moral. Right, so of course, he uh, he said look it up, but he doesn't pull up the scripture itself. He uh, <laughs> brings up his commentary, which is, again, pretty much the same thing as Talmud, but modern equivalent. Really wrong. In fact, the closest thing addressing the topic of abortion is a passage from Exodus that says if someone attacks a woman in a way that causes a miscarriage, the penalty for the person responsible would be a monetary fine, treating it like a loss of property, unlike the fine for killing a person, which would be life for life in those days. So according to the people of the Bible who were trying to model their laws as to what was fair in God's eyes, a fetus that isn't fully formed and still needs the womb to survive is seen as a woman's property and not yet to be equated with a fully autonomous human being. So I want to touch on uh, two different things. We can go ahead and get rid of these. I want to uh, touch on two different things that he said there, because the first thing I want to touch on is how he said it would, it's only a monetary fine. Um, but then the other thing he, he mentioned was that it's a woman's property and she should be able to do with it whatever. She wants, and the Bible says it's a woman's property. Let's actually get the scripture, because of course he didn't read the scripture. In Exodus 21 and 22, 
It says, if men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her. So if a situation happens where a man causes a woman to miscarry, and yet no mischief follow, meaning uh, uh, the man who was the father of the child doesn't seek vengeance in this case, or you know any other type of mischief like that, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. So according to this passage in Exodus, the child that is in the womb belongs to the father of that child. As it says in Numbers 1 and 18, the pedigree, pardon me, is determined by the seed of the father. That's why Matthew, the book of Matthew starts with the lineage of Christ through his father, because that was important in the eyes of the Israelites. That is important in the eyes of God is the seed of the father. And according to the scripture, the fetus actually belongs to the man who put it in the woman's stomach. And he, meaning the guy who caused the miscarriage, shall pay as the judges determine. Right? So, first, the man who lost his child will bring the situation to the judges. And then him and the judges will agree upon something suitable, whether that be you know, the life of the man, or whether that be a fine, or whether that be, you know, uh, a hand, or whatever they agree upon, that is what that man would have to pay, and I don't, I want to finish up the context, and if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, two for two, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, strike for strike, right, so if it gets messy as far as vengeance is concerned afterwards, and if it gets all muddy, then they would just have to give, uh, judgment you know righteously but the point is it's not even the woman's child to do as she wishes it's really the property of the man who put it there the same way that if a man plants the seed of an apple tree in the earth does that tree belong to the earth no not really it belonged to the man who put it there so that's the first thing. That's the first scripture I wanted to touch on. Now, let's get some more on this. Let's get some more on the child in the womb. Here in Psalms 22. And what verse do I want? Verse 9. But thou, meaning God, art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. So uh, David was saying God was his God from the womb since his birth, right? Verse 10, I was cast upon thee from the womb. So he said, not only whenever I came out of the womb, but when I was in the womb as well, I was cast upon God. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. David said, even whenever he was in the the belly of his mother, he was cast upon God. So God has a connection with that fetus. You may not like it, but that's what the scriptures say. Let's get some more on that. Because this is actually a little bit more well known here in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, where it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. So a lot of people say, well, life begins at conception. Well, no, God said life began even before then. God said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, meaning while you were still in the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So God is making plans for these children while they are still in the womb. And even before then, from the foundation of the earth. There is a reason why God gives life to these people. There is a reason why God puts life in these women's stomach. And it is God who does it every time. This is Deuteronomy 32 and 39. See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive God is the one who gives life and he kills he wounds and he heals 
I wound and I heal. There, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. So God is the one who makes these lives. Even from before they were in the womb. And the reason why a lot of these people get abortions is out of selfish reasons, right? 99% of abortions, there are some extenuating circumstances, whether it be health or, or whether it be, you know, the R word or whatever, where people get abortions, but 99% of the time it's just because they're not ready to have a child. But, of course, they're ready to have sex unprotected, right? They were ready to uh, give in to their lust, but they don't want to deal with the consequences of that. But here, in Leviticus 18 and 21, let's see what it says. Because ultimately, what abortions are is child sacrifice. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. So back then, they didn't necessarily kill the baby while it was in the womb. They would wait till they had the baby and then let it pass through the fire to mull it. And we look at this like it's something uh, different than what people do today. But it's the same thing. People back then weren't just like, oh, we need a bountiful harvest. I better get my child. No, they weren't ready to have children. They wanted to have their own lives. So. They just give a reason to get rid of the baby. They say, oh, we're giving it to Mullet. And what do they do today? Well, I, I got I to got, I, I have my own life. You know, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for this responsibility. And once you really know how they think and how these demons work, how these people work, their mental processes, you understand a little better. Because a lot of people think Satanists like actually worship Satan. But no, if you actually look into it, Satanists don't believe in Satan at all. They don't worship Satan at all. They worship themselves. And whenever you sacrifice your child for your own self, that is sacrificing it to Satan. It's the same thing. You're serving devils and not God. But of course, Samantha B had her panel of women on. So that's why I brought this scripture. This is uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, meaning keep the dress code. At least three quarters of those women were not keeping the dress code. I didn't necessarily, I couldn't tell what the, what the Muslim woman looked like she had a dress on, maybe. It said with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, meaning don't focus on the outer, focus on the inner beauty, but which becometh women professing godliness. See, women are supposed to be able to profess godliness. That is not what they were doing right there. They were completely going against what God says. With good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Women are not supposed to be giving their understanding on doctrine. They're not supposed to be uh, teaching the congregation. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why? For Adam was first formed, then Eve, because that would be out of order. Not only that, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So Adam's transgression was not following Satan or, or listening to false doctrine. It was listening to his wife concerning the false doctrine. He was never tricked by Satan. That was Eve. She, that was her transgression. Adam's transgression was that he was out of order and following his wife, as opposed to leading her. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety, because having a baby can change a woman. I want to end it. I want to close it out with Numbers 27 and verse 16. And this is in the same vein that I was just in. This wraps it up. Nice and neat in a little bow. Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh. So God is the God of the spirits of all flesh. Men, women, children, animals. God made all of them and put all of them in order where they should be. Set a man over the congregation. 
So God knows what he's doing. He knows that's the order. Set men over the congregation. Of course, Samantha B. had her panel of all women supposed to be experts on religion. As if they wouldn't be biased <laughs> concerning this issue. But uh, I hope y'all got some understanding from that. Uh, the next video I, I want to make and put out soon, I won't, uh, I won't be like commenting on uh, videos like this one was. I, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the history of Israel and go into some scriptures and show uh, some things concerning uh, Israel around the globe. But uh, well, as well, I'll be able to make more consistent content and, and you know just do the work, be better at uh, uploading. Well, it's well, you know. All right. Shalom, Israel. Most high in Christ bless.